working with us tonight. And um, on behalf of all the organizers, we find it very encouraging and uh, very reassuring in a lot of ways that so many of you seem interested in uh, this topic as well. My name is Patrick, and this is Kate. And we represent the U of T Secular Alliance, which is a pretty new uh, campus-based organization that's made up of uh, both students and faculty. Uh, we run events like this, and uh, also more generally provide uh, a social atmosphere and a network for uh, students and faculty who are skeptics, atheists, agnostics, free thinkers, and so on. So. Uh, with that, I'd like to uh, turn the mic over to Justin Trottier, who is the executive director of one of our sponsors, the Center for Inquiry, and also a Globamail.com online humanist panelist. Justin. Hi. Can you hear me okay? any better? Yeah. All right, good stuff. It's great to see all of you on such a frigid Friday night. Um, so I'm here from the Centre for Inquiry Ontario, as uh, Patrick mentioned, so I bring you greetings from CFI. Uh, just a few words, CFI is Canada's premier venue for humanists, free thinkers, and skeptics. It's the first of its kind and is located a mere two minutes away from here, as many of you may know, at 216 Beverly Street just off campus. CFI's mission, the promotion of science, reason, free inquiry, and secular values in all areas of human endeavor, is advanced through an ambitious variety of activities. These include educational programs, like our ongoing Voices of Reason speaker series, of which this is a part, social and community services, such as our coping with our religion and secular sobriety support groups, political advocacy, such as our leadership in the One School System Network, that helped bring an end to the disastrous, disastrous notion of government-funded religious schools. Well, so long as you're not Catholic, that is. And finally, campus outreach. Of our 20 affiliated student groups, one of our most active is the University of Toronto Secular Alliance, from which, incidentally, much of our national free thought movement really sprang, especially the student component. It is deeply gratifying to have come together with the UTSA and with our allies, Skeptics Canada, to bring you tonight's event. I want to appeal to each of you to help us continue to expand our efforts by becoming a friend of the Center. We've had a lot of successes over the last year. I mentioned a few already. It should also be noted that we've been featured in a national press piece on TV or in national, in national newspapers on average of once a month since our inception, including a regular humanist panel position that I've been invited on for the Globe and Mail Online, as Patrick <coughs> mentioned. We believe these achievements speak for themselves, but we could be doing so much more. If your values are the same as our values, please become a friend of the Center today. This is our membership program. The cost is modest, $60 a year, $20 for students, $80 for couples. Benefits include free admission to all of the events we host, including tonight's event. Discounts on magazines, books, and merchandise. Discounts and admission to conferences across the world. And entrance to Friend of the Center only activities, such as the reception that preceded tonight's event. And the catered reception we're holding in two weeks before the next major public talk by Dr. Stuart Kaufman. Quick plug for that, it's called Reinventing the Sacred, and we have information on it outside. And of course, you'll be solidifying your commitment to science, reason, and free inquiry. And if you've already paid uh, to get to tonight's event, we'll offer you sort of a reimbursement and just discount it against uh, your joining CFI if you decide to do so. I would also like to mention that CFI donations, other than membership, are now tax exempt. And we have launched our development campaign accordingly. If you would like to substantially increase our impact, please consider making a generous pledge to our operations, such as a three-year pledge in amounts ranging from $100 $100,000. Our goal is to raise pledges totaling $350,000 in the next three years. Our immediate goals are to raise funds to put towards two primary objectives. One, hiring an additional staff member here at CFI Ontario. And two, launching communities and centres in other major cities in Canada. Now we have our sites set on Montreal and Vancouver. Considering what we've accomplished here in Toronto with moderate resources, consider what your generous support could bring about. We are serious about our commitment to this movement, and we hope you are too. For more information on CFI, please visit www.cfiontario.org and or check out our display just outside those doors. If you are interested in joining or making a donation, you can speak to me following this presentation. I look forward to working with as many of you as possible on the issues we all hold dear. Thank you and enjoy tonight's presentation.
All right, one of the most alarming trends in society is the increasing popularity of pseudoscience in so many different forms. While the controversy over intelligent design is likely the most familiar case, pseudoscience is all around us. If you've ever walked up Young Street, you'll have noticed the multitude of psychics, poem readers, and alternative healthcare providers offering miracle cures for every thinkable ailment. These businesses operate by promising that their untested, unscientific services will offer you something that science has somehow overlooked because, of course, scientists are not interested in the truth. The reality is almost none of this medicine has been tested, and if it has, the test usually shows that it relies almost entirely on the placebo effect. Even worse, complementary and alternative medicine is making its way into more legitimate venues. Pharmacies have larger and larger amounts of shelf space dedicated to herbal and homeopathic <coughs> remedies. The Ontario government recently legitimized Chinese medicine, and Ryerson University, a publicly funded institution, now offers training in this practice. Our honored guest tonight has a wealth of experience dealing with these issues. Dr. David Cahoon is an internationally renowned professor of pharmacology at University College London. Best known for his pioneering research on single ion channels, Dr. Cahoon completed postgraduate research at Yale University and the University of Southampton before joining the faculty at UCL in 1979, where he has remained since. He previously held the A.J. Clark Chair of Pharmacology at UCL and was elected to the Royal Society in 1985. In addition to being an esteemed scholar, he has been an outspoken critic of alternative medicine for many years and runs a popular website dedicated to debunking bad science at dcscience.net. He has published articles in newspapers and top academic journals questioning the teaching of alternative medicine in universities as science. He has also done various media appearances, including this weekend's Sunday edition on CBC Radio 1 and an article in tomorrow's National Post, so watch for those. He recently caused a stir when he was forced to remove his website from the UCL server after criticizing the claims of a herbalist who subsequently threatened legal action. This clear infringement of academic freedom adds a troubling dimension to the intrusion of pseudoscience in academia and society at large. His website was reinstated, but the issues which sparked the incident are far from resolved in either Great Britain or North America. I'm proud to, produce our, to, proud, to, <laughs> proud to present our honored guest, speaking on science in an age of endarkenment, Dr. David Cahoon. Actually, the first slide says it all. I can you can just read that and you can go home. <laughs> it was written the year before I was born. God help us. And uh, couldn't really sum up better the situation in which we find ourselves now. The age of enlightenment was a, a beautiful thing. People cast aside dogma and authority. They started to think for themselves. Natural science flourished, understanding of the real world increased. The hegemony of religion slowly declined, well, except in the Christian Taliban and the Southern USA, anyway. Uh, the hegemony of religion slowly declined, real universities took root, and democracy gradually took hold. The, modern, the whole modern world in which we live now was born during that period. Until recently, we were making pretty good progress. So what happened? The, perhaps the most prominent sign of irrationality in the United States is one that I'm not going to say much about. I'm sure we can call the secular alliance. You hear a lot about it already. In fact, the, the one slide I will show about creationists is a call for hope. Um, well, there have been two obvious causes for hope quite recently. One was the judgment in Pennsylvania, where uh, an American judge gave a damning indictment of intelligent designs that, that, I, that I certainly couldn't improve on. It was a, he, he said they're liars. I'm trying to uh, circumvent the Constitution, which of course is both of which of course are quite accurate, but you don't really expect it from an American judge. Um, and there's this wonderful piece here from the Washington Post staff writer. Um, 
the, the pressures are there, but people are fighting back. What, what I'm going to talk about in the first half is, as Kate alluded to, <coughs> the growth in crackpot medicine, and rather more serious in the second half, the growth of corruption in universities as a result of delusional thinking. The, there's a nice book by a chap called Francis Ween, who puts the beginning of this period roughly around 1980, this period where wishful thinking began to matter more than truth. That, 1980 was a sort of remarkable year, because within one year, we had Margaret Thatcher, Ronald Reagan, and Ayatollah Khomeini. And people welcomed them, all three of them. Quite, quite baffling to me. But, but um, the Thatcher and Reaganomics era, with its deregulation of uh, financial interests, well, it led eventually to Enron, but, but it led to an era in which money mattered more than truth. And that led to a vast increase in the popularity of, among other things, crackpot medicine. Well, it was correlated with it, but I think they're actually all aspects of the same way of thinking. The truth doesn't really matter very much. It's what you would wish to be true that mattered. You could argue that the most important bit of wishful thinking for its effect on humanity was the wishful thinking of Tony Blair when he stood up in front of the House of Commons and said Saddam Hussein can bomb the UK at 45 minutes notice, which was perfectly well known at the time he said it, not to be true, but he had gone through some curious mental thought process which allowed him to say it anyway. Uh, whether you call it lying is, is an interesting question. He a psychiatrist for that, I think. The, okay, let's, 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 let's just talk a minute about the, me the medical side of things. I'm sure many of you know what homeopathy is, but experience shows that um, not everybody does, so I'll give you a, a, quick, a, quick, a quick run through. Homeopathy is giving you medicines that contain no medicine, so it's very easy to sum up. Um, ju justify that. <coughs> well, it's based on the completely bizarre postulate that the less you take, the bigger the effect. You would think that alone, is, it sounds so balmy when you say it, that you would think that that would have just, it would just be laughed off the street, but for some reason it's not. They label their bottles things like 20x or 30c. 30c means dilution by a factor of 10. 100 to the 30, which is 10 to the 60. <coughs> Quite a big number. But what does it mean? Well, a one molar solution contains Avogadro's number molecules. So a 30c dilution contains 6 times 10 to the minus 37 molecules per liter. <laughs> and that, so how big would the pill have to be? In order to contain one molecule on average, it becomes a stochastic problem. The, the pill would have to be <laughs> radius 10 to the 11 meters, which happens to be quite close to the distance from the sun to the earth. <laughs> but you want a really big effect, you don't give 30 C, you give 200 C, which is uh, one molecule in uh, a size of roughly the, the known universe. I mean, it is really so silly that you, you cannot believe uh, that anyone would take it seriously. And indeed, at the time it was introduced, which was the beginning of the 19th century in Germany, uh, of course, it may have done some good at that time, because conventional physicians were uh, completely barbaric at that time. They killed people by bloodletting. And if you could give them a pill that contained nothing, you might well have been better off. But it was very apparent to, uh, to intelligent people at the time it was introduced that it was barbaric. Even to archbishops. I mean, archbishops may not be the first people that the Toronto Secular Alliance would turn for uh, advice on on science, but uh, Archbishop Dome had it pretty pretty well down in the ditty he wrote at the time. The more serious critic was Oliver Wendell Holmes. Some of you will find some of you will probably be more or less troubled by that parody of medieval theology, which finds its dogma in the doctrine of homeopathy miracle of transubstantiation in the mystery of its dilutions, its church in the people who have mistaken their century, and its priests in those who have mistaken their calling. I love that imagery, hard-hitting stuff. I wrote that in 1871. 
Uh, earlier than that, he'd written a long essay called Homeopathy and Its Kindred Delusions in 1842. At a time, just after Hans invented the subject, he, he was actually the father of the more, perhaps more famous Supreme Court judge called Oliver Wendell Holmes. The, the book that I mentioned, um, How Mumbo Jumbo Conquered the World, uh, I think puts very well the synthesis of these various forms of delusional thinking from whether it's in economics on one hand or, or medicine on the other hand or perpetual motion, which is all of those things are synthesized in a nice way in that book, so I can recommend it. The, um, another one that I like that I read recently is, is this one by Dan Hurley, which is specifically in American, that traces the rise of the supplement hucksters which surround you on every side there. L largely through government sponsorship, actually. Um, and the deluded senator gets the idea that it's a good thing. Um, the really worrying thing, though, is when this is taken seriously in universities, who are meant to be the very people who specialize in distinguishing truth from fiction. Here's a couple of exam papers. So jot down the answers and we'll mark them afterwards. The, the, that first question, they, they both look pretty, pretty antique, don't they? That first question is, it came from an exam in Materia Medica and Therapeutics from UCL in 1863. Sydney Ring was rather famous to those of you in physiology. The second question is a bit more baffling because it uses words which I can't understand. The word miasmatic is interesting because miasmas are the means by which cholera was supposed to be spread before people realized uh, how it actually was spread. Before the time of the Broad Street, John Snow and the Broad Street Pump and the subsequent discovery of the, organ, the microorganism that caused cholera. So perhaps that was also from the uh, early 19th century when talk of miasms was common. But no, that's exact, the second exam question was not from 1830, it was from 2005 and it was set in an exam by our close neighbor in London, the University of Westminster. Unfortunately, they didn't give model answers. I would love to have seen the model answer. So, uh, that seems to be fairly <coughs> grotesque. Now, since homeopathic pills don't contain anything, they can't poison you. And the aphorism that homeopathy doesn't poison your body, it poisons your mind. Because uh, if you believe that, you can certainly believe anything else. Believing anything that comes along is not a good idea. I'm sure you all agree. The people who practice it, though, are not harmless, certainly not all harmless, because they don't restrict themselves to treating things which are unimportant. A, a friend wrote to a lady called Kate Birch, who was vice president of the North American Society of Homeopaths, inquiring about malaria prevention. And in her reply, she said, homeopathy is more effective than any Western medication. So she was advising people who visited Africa to take a pill that contained nothing to, to ward off the malaria rather than the, um, the things which uh, do indeed work. And that kills people. So it, it, it's no longer a joke when that sort of thing happens. She was rather peeved about this. Well, she was rather peeved when I published it all on the website, at least. <laughs> <laughs> so I was really quite surprised when she said she was going to be in London and could she come to visit me? I'd rather try I might get shot or something. But, but no, this lady was a sweet, kind, and utterly deluded, totally balmy. <laughs> and she came to present me with her book, which explains how you can not only cure malaria, but also yellow fever, dengue, hepatitis A, typhoid, and rabies, among many other things. If only you stop all that evil vaccination, of course, and just take a pill that contained nothing. And she, I think she really thought that if I read this book carefully, I would be persuaded. And so um, they gave me some more ammunition to put on the web, at least. <laughs> now, but there's a very interesting aspect to this, because if you read the North American Society of Homeopaths website, they, they have a code of practice. They want to be professional. They're all desperate to be proper doctors. No matter. The North American Society of Homeopaths standards of practice guidelines say, do not claim that you can treat any disease, condition, or ailment, or imply that you can do so. Well, if they obeyed that, <laughs> what were they there for? <laughs> Be extremely careful when speaking or writing about the treatment of particular diseases, 
and never offer or claim to help anybody. <laughs> well, there's a certain realism about that, but of course they don't do it. And exactly the same thing's happened in, in, in the UK. A BBC television program went round ten homeopaths with their hidden cameras and they asked the same question actually about going to, to um, Africa. And nine out of ten recommended that you didn't take the regular treatment, but you took a homeopathic pill, and that caused quite a stir when you came out. It also caused a big ruction between the medical homeopaths and the non medical ones. In the UK, there's two homeopathic organizations the Faculty of Homeopaths, who were medically qualified, that's rather small, of course, and, and um, the Society of Homeopaths, which is much bigger and a great deal balmier. And uh, the medical homeopaths said this is uh, Peter Fisher, the clinical director of the Royal London Homeopathic Hospital, the Queen's homeopathic physician, of whom more in a minute, he said that he was very angry about this. So they're actually at war with each other. It's a bit like religion. You get into Nisai wars between sects uh, about the number of angels that sit on the head of a pin. Um, but this isn't a joke, because, because the web is largely unregulated, and in a way, thank heavens, uh, it's uh, exempt from advertising standards. So you can buy uh, this bottle, which is highly effective for treating all types of malaria, even the strains that have developed a resistance to chemical-based drugs. They're, they're, they're drugs that don't contain chemicals, apparently. Not, but exactly, they're made of them, I'm not sure. The, but this is a 200C homeopathic dilute, far more dilute than the Earth to the Sun one. Uh, so, It, 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 this is, and, and this is made, the division is made in 15% alcohol, and it costs 32 pounds for 30 mils, so about a thousand pounds a litre, and all people do is make you drunk, but beer is cheaper. <laughs> <laughs> and people are paying money for this. Not only are they being ripped off from a lot of money, they're also getting ill. Um, so, it isn't true that even homeopathy is free of risks, because homeopaths behind closed doors will offer to cure almost anything. Their codes of conduct say that they shouldn't, and they're getting, having been caught out several times, disobeying their own codes of conduct, that's something which never really, despite their boasts about self-regulation, never results in any disciplinary action at all. What it results in is them sending each other emails on their secret bulletin boards, which aren't that secret, actually, because it's quite easy to get into them, saying, <laughs> and they say, somebody sent me this email, I think it might be a journalist, and can you advise me how to answer? It, it's wonderful because that's a complete admission that the answer they give depends on whether they think it's a gullible customer or uh, possibly a, a scientist who isn't so gullible. So it's an admission that they are lying. Very, very sad. Um, but if this was just homeopaths on the high street, well, it'd be bad enough then. What's really mind-boggling is when universities get involved in it. Oregon Health and Science University, a very respectable institution, that's where I'm going to next. <laughs> so I've got this slide specially for them. But like most universities now, they have a quackery department, <laughs> staffed by academics, by professors who are paid the same as me and you, or whatever your job is. I'm pretty damn annoying. Quackademics, that, that's a word. <laughs> Which I discovered only yesterday on a Dr. R.W.'s blog. I put a, a link on my mini blog to it. It says, and it is just simply inaccurate and deceptive, this stuff on the OHS website. It treats ailments with very small amounts of the same substance that causes the patient's symptoms. They're not very small, they're zero. There's a qualitative difference between very small and zero. It's, it's just simply being evasive to call it very small. And then it says explanations for why, how homeopathy works, why homeopathy works, range from the idea that the Homeopathic medicine stimulates the body's own natural defenses to the idea that homeopathic medicine retains a memory of the original substance. However, there is no factual explanation for why homeopathy works and more research is needed. Notice the completely implicit assumption that it does work. There's no suggestion that it might, maybe it doesn't. But of course, there's, apart from the grotesquely absurd nature of the proposition, there's no empirical evidence either. Whenever a good test is done, it's never any better than placebo. 
So for a university website, I think that's pretty smelly, actually. And they're not the only ones. This is the role of shame. This is for uh, the USA. You know, everywhere you can think of almost is on there. Mayo Clinic. Oh, it's on the oh, McGaster has got two here. So it's not just the USA. I don't know if Ryerson something on that's your local home will woo. Um, it goes on endlessly. That's it. <laughs> okay, there's a few. All of these people are employing academics to preach this sort of nonsense. The Scripps Institute is a pretty famous place too. This is what they say about healing touch. It's an energy-based, non-intensive treatment. Ener energy-based doesn't mean anything whatsoever. It's just, just words. It's performed by registered nurses who recognize and manipulate and balance the electromagnetic magnetic fields surrounding the human body, thereby promoting healing. This is written on their website as though it meant something. Of course, nobody has ever detected such a field, and if they had, nobody has, certainly, certainly has nobody shown that it does you any good to manipulate it. It's just sheer invention. Meaningless baloney, as I think that well, it's a fair enough description. And on Yale, where I spent a little while and enjoyed it, there's some even worse stuff. Because if you look at this one, they try to equate um, not believing in... Well, they, they, they try to equate, equate uh, believing in crackpot medicine with liberalism. It doesn't actually sort of say political liberalism, but that's certainly a strong implication. Yale, being liberal, believes in crackpot medicine more than Harvard, and they're very proud of that. Harvard's conservative. It, it is quite, it's really quite outrageous uh, attempt to, 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 to link it with politics in a way which is uh, I think precisely the opposite of the truth, at least among my friends it is. Um, the, just since I've been here, uh, some of the lady I talked to her last year has produced a book, Suckers, How Alternative Medicine Makes Fools of Us All. I haven't read it yet, but I did see the she has said in the press release. And there's a, a, a very interesting criticism, which may be slightly lost here. George Monbiot may not be known here, but in, he's quite well known in the United Kingdom. He's a firebrand environmentalist, regarded as quite excessively left-wing, certainly by our government. And, you know, if, if, if anyone could, could, could be, not be accused of being a conservative, it's George Monbiot. But he thought it was a great book. And this, this link with politics that, uh, that Yale was trying to make, or someone on behalf of Yale, was um, just, just plain silly. Uh, of course, when you raise these arguments with quacks, they immediately accuse you of being in league with the, with the big pharmaceutical industry. Uh, well, I'm not, so uh, I can defend myself clearly against that. But there is no doubt that the big pharmaceutical <coughs> industry behaves pretty badly at times. The situation is no different for the quacks, though. They also lead with their own big alternative medicine industry. It, it is, they talk often as though uh, vitamins and homeopathic remedies were some sort of homespun thing made by somebody in the back kitchen and all natural. But of course, they're made by giant companies who make vast amounts of money since they didn't have to spend a penny on research, and in the case of homeopathy, they didn't have to spend a penny on ingredients either. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, miraculously, despite their wealth, they never fund proper clinical trials, which itself, I suppose, is a pretty good indication of dishonesty, because if they really believed it worked, they would fund some bloody good trials, and then if they came out positive, everyone would believe them, the whole argument would be over. They, they must know that they're not going to come out positive, or they would have done that a long time ago. So, so it must be basically dishonest, not, not just deluded, at least at the level of industry, I think some of the ladies on the high street do actually believe it. So the Columbia's uh, program, for example, is funded by a company called Origins, which is really a sort of glorified cosmetics company, uh, more than the essential oils and things. So they're, they're in hand in glove with the, with the industry too, and, and appropriately. Have their 